My name is Matt Villamino. I am a Regional Interpretive Coordinator with the Massachusetts State Park System, so I take care of the interpretive program in central Massachusetts. And when we use that word interpretive, we're not talking about language interpretation, we're talking about interpreting the resource, so translating what's there in the cultural and the natural history so that it's relevant to our visitors. I actually went to school for communications graphic design ended up as an event planner, volunteered at Jamestown when I was in Virginia for a while, and then moved back up to Massachusetts and ended up with Massachusetts State Parks. Worked seasonally for many years. I don't know how it is in other countries, but in the United States, if you wanna work in the, the park system, it's going you're going to be starting seasonally in all likelihood. And then I finally got year round in 2019 in my current role, so. Been, so, a, been a journey. I get paid to hike, so I enjoy that. I wanted to see, because we're talking about Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Rock, and I know that you, you uh, have quite a bit of experience with that. So we have a lot of kids here, both in the United States and over in Europe, who are learning a bit about American history. So can you just dive right in and tell us all about it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this, what, what I'm going to be doing for you guys today is a program that we do at Pilgrim Memorial State Park, Plymouth Rock. And it's one that we, do. when I was there, we did this every half hour. So if you were a park ranger at Pilgrim Memorial State Park, you would learn this talk pretty well. It's been a couple of years since I've given it in person. So I'm a little rusty, but we'll be fine. So for the purpose of this, we'll just pretend we're, we're there at Plymouth, Plymouth Rock. Um, welcome everybody. As I said, my name is Matt Villalmino. I am one of the interpretive staff members for the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. While I'm no longer there anymore, I used to work at Pilgrim Memorial State Park, which is home to what's behind me on the screen is Plymouth Rock. Now, the Department of Conservation and Recreation manages over 450,000 acres statewide. That's almost 10% of the land in Massachusetts with parks large and small. Now Pilgrim Memorial State Park only has about seven acres. We're one of the smallest state parks in the system. However, we have one of the largest attendances. Can anybody guess why we, uh, you can't see my pointing, can it, but can anybody guess why we're one of the largest? That rock right behind me, Plymouth Rock. Lots of people come all over the world every day to see that rock. Now, one of the things I'll see frequently when I'm in the portico so the, you can't see it right here, but you can, you can see the rock. It's, it's sunken in a bit from street level. So when you come into the portico, looks like one of those old uh, Greek, kind of almost like a mausoleum with columns. You come into the portico, there's a railing, and then you look down to the rock. And I'll see people come in, they'll put their hands on the railing, they'll look down, they'll pause. Really? That's it? I thought it would be bigger. Now I know it's kind of hard for you guys to see the scale there, um, but it's maybe something that I can get my arms around. How many people thinking of Plymouth Rock would be thinking it's some massive, huge boulder? You can use the thumbs up button too to indicate yes. Now the rock did used to be larger and actually you're only seeing half of it in the picture behind me. Another half of it is under the ground and then it used to be larger, it used to be about twice as big around. People used to be able to allow, if you were a tourist in Plymouth, you could pay the town of Plymouth a dollar, you'd get a hammer and a chisel, and you'd be able to take a piece of Plymouth Rock home as a souvenir. We don't allow that anymore. Now, when people look at the rock, they'll ask, why is it so special? They're a little bit underwhelmed by it, and they look, well, what makes this rock so special? Now, I can tell you right away that what makes Plymouth Rock special has nothing to do with its size, but there are two ways that I can answer that question. Why is Plymouth Rock important? Now, the first way I can talk about is its history. The basic story of the rock 
is that when the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth in 1620, that they got off their boat, they stepped onto the rock, they stepped off the rock, they stepped onto the beach, welcome to Plymouth. Now they did land in Provincetown before getting to Plymouth. So if you're not really familiar with Massachusetts geography, but you look at the map of Plymouth, of Massachusetts, you need to see that Cape Cod, the, the sea there. Provincetown is at the very tip of Cape Cod and that's where they landed first. Of course, they were originally trying to get down to where, uh, where New York is today. After exploring for a bit, they did find Plymouth, but they never mentioned stepping on the rock. Now, does that mean it didn't happen? No, just because you didn't write something down doesn't mean it didn't happen. The pilgrims wrote a lot of stuff down, but a lot of it was more important stuff. So how do we know this story about the pilgrims landing on the rock? What we have is actually an oral tradition. The legend of the rock really starts in 1769, so quite a bit of time after the pilgrims have landed. At this time, a group of residents in Plymouth decide to start celebrating the anniversary of the landing of the pilgrims, or as they were known at that time as the Forefathers. And they still actually have that holiday in Plymouth today called Forefathers Day. One of the people at that gathering tells the story about the rock. Now, how did he hear about the story? He heard about that story in 1741 when he was only six years old from one of the elders of the church who told it here on the beach when the town was going to cover the rock with a new pier. He in turn heard the story from his father who heard it from one of the original Mayflower passengers. Now, I don't know if you guys play telephone where you're from, but that sounds a whole lot like a game of telephone to me. So did they actually step on the rock? Most modern historians believe they don't. If anybody's been boating, you really don't want to take a wooden boat right up against the side of a big rock. You might break it. Is there some element of truth to the story? I would say yes. I personally believe they used the rock as a landmark or a waypoint to be able to find this spot again. So when they first landed here, in case they chose this location, which they did. The original settlement where the Pilgrim houses were is only about 300 feet from the location of Plymouth Rock. So they 100% saw it. And if the kids didn't play on the rock, I would be shocked. While they may or may not have stepped on it, they definitely knew it was here. So when somebody asks us why Plymouth Rock is important, we can share that story and people will be pretty happy with it. But there's another way, a more meaningful way that we can answer the question, why is Plymouth Rock important? And that's by talking about it as a symbol. And it can represent many things to many people. So I'm just gonna share a few examples of some of the things that it, it means to some of our visitors. Now first, and perhaps most obviously, that rock can represent the settlement of Plymouth. Now Plymouth is not the oldest European settlement in the United States, but they are the oldest continuously lived in English settlement in the United States. Plymouth is known as America's hometown, and the rock can represent that. But it can also represent the bravery and faith of the passengers on board that ship. As Governor Bradford writes, all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and both must be enterprised and overcome with answerable courage. When they got on board that ship, they didn't know if they would succeed. They didn't even know if they would survive. Let's look at a couple of the earlier settlements for comparison. Give me a thumbs up if you've heard of the lost colony of Roanoke in what's now North Carolina. Anybody heard of the lost colony of Roanoke? One word, and you can put this in the chat. One word, anybody guess what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke? Anyone wanna guess? The lost colony of Roanoke? Ralph, you can, yeah, I see um, you smiling, you can put it in. Yeah, one of the kids said went missing. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing that, I'm just seeing yours. No, because I have it only to where they can, uh, you guys can Oh, okay, check. that's fine. So yeah, the, the colony was lost. Now, if we move up the coast to Jamestown, Virginia, we have that colony there much more well known. At Jamestown, the early years were really rough. On average, seven or eight out of every 10 people who went there in the first 10 years or so died. So knowing that the whole first English colony just vanished, seven or eight out of every 10 members of the, the next English colony are dying, how many of you are getting on that boat and going over to Plum, oh, going over to the New World? Anyone want to volunteer? 
Now, granted, as kids, you're not going to have much of a choice. Dad says you're getting on the boat, you're getting on the boat. But as you can see, it required an incredible amount of bravery and faith to get on board the Mayflower. And this rock can represent that. But that's just one side of the story here in Plymouth. Many times when people come to the park, all we hear about are pilgrims, pilgrims, pilgrims. And what gets overlooked are the Wampanoag, the indigenous peoples of this area. Prior to the pilgrims' arrival, right here in what was Plymouth, there was a large settlement called Patuxet. And that settlement of, of Wampanoag was wiped out by disease just a few years before the pilgrims arrived. Three months after the Mayflower landed, Massasoit, the leader of the Wampanoags, approached the pilgrims and they signed a peace treaty. Massasoit agreed to let the settlers live on this land and help teach them what they needed to know to live here. In exchange, the pilgrims agreed to help defend Massasoit against his enemies. Without that treaty and without that help, the Mayflower, would the Mayflower passengers survive? Likely not. And this rock can represent that help. And the rock can also represent the change to the native way of life and what happens to them as the area is colonized. As more and more settlers come, come over from throughout what becomes the United States, the indigenous peoples are driven off their land. Their people are killed, either in war or by European diseases. Their whole way of life that they had known for thousands of years is fundamentally altered. And those who survive are forced to adapt to living in a whole new world. One thing I would like to point out is that the Wampanoag people are still here today, although their lives are very different than they are 400 years ago. This rock can represent that, and it is important not to forget. So if you look at Plymouth Rock as just a rock, it's probably not the most impressive thing that you'll see. If you look at Plymouth Rock symbolically, it becomes larger, and I would say it's the most important rock that we have here in this country. Now, obviously, in 10 minutes, I can only tell you so much. We'll be have some availability for questions right afterwards. And I also have some resources that I can send over to Ralph to pass along to all of the to all of you. Uh, that'll include some books and different websites to visit. And my normal thing would be to promote the walking tour, which we can't go do now. So we'll ignore that. You're all good. Um, so but if you look at Plymouth Rock as just a rock, Again, probably not the most important thing you'll see today. So what I ask you to do is when you think about Plymouth Rock, think about Plymouth Rock as a symbol and think about what Plymouth Rock means to you. And when you talk about Plymouth Rock with your family and with your friends, talk about these stories and share these stories. And when you do that, you will have answered the question for yourself, why is Plymouth Rock important? Thank, Thank you very much. That was awesome. On behalf of the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, state parks, not national parks. <laughs> um, I appreciate your time and can take any questions that the people may have. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to rapid fire questions as, if we can for like the next uh, 10 minutes. And guys, yeah, sure. I, I got some emailed to me and some are in the chat. Feel free to message them. Um, so one of the kids wanted to know, and I want to know this as well, how long was the journey, the estimated journey that the Mayflower took mm -hmm. from, uh, from England, from Europe to Massachusetts? How long did that take back then? It was about three months. So remember during this time, the ship is fairly small. You're all below decks for most of the voyage because you don't want to get in the sailor's way. There's about a hundred passengers and 30 or so crew on this ship. It is not a big ship quarters are tight and it's it's not a fun ride uh, one of the things the, the reasons why it takes so long they're not necessarily sailing straight across the ocean especially earlier on when they're doing Jamestown they're going down and around because that's where they know the the, the winds are I think by James by Plymouth time they're coming a little bit more directly straight across but they ran into lots of weather problems that they had to to encounter that is, I mean, it's, it's such a huge part of our story as Americans. And I think as, as human beings, because it was that big disconnect between the Native Americans as well as the Europeans and combining. And we have a large majority of us in America are descendants of uh, Europeans. So um, can you talk about, uh, is there, you had mentioned about the treaty. 
which is uh, very famous in American history. Is there any significance with that and our Thanksgiving? So oh, good, good question. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving and the Pilgrims is a whole separate program, but I'll give you the nickel version of it. The Pilgrim, so the, what we call the first Thanksgiving, or what many people call the first Thanksgiving, is mentioned twice in the primary sources. Bradford mentions it in his book, and then I think it's Winslow mentions it in the other one, and I'll, I'll send you those references. And it's only about a paragraph total what we think happened there. So they definitely had a, 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 um, a fall harvest festival is what we think it likely was. So if you're a farmer, you've done the hard work, you've planted, you've maintained the crops, you've gotten, you've harvested the crops. Now it's time to have a party. And harvest festivals date back at pretty much as long as there's been harvests. Did they call this a Thanksgiving? probably not a Thanksgiving to them or a day of Thanksgiving is something very different. If anything, the day of Thanksgiving would have been called when they first landed in Provincetown. And actually days of Thanksgiving were often, though not always, accompanied by fasting at that time period. Uh, so the other big question with that, thanks, with that we call the first Thanksgiving, the Harvest Festival in, in 1621, we know that Massasoit and his people were there. We don't know that they were invited. So what happened was, or one of the things they were doing is they were doing some target shooting. They were practicing shooting and Massasoit and some of his people were nearby. They heard the shooting and they decided to investigate. And then they just basically joined the, the party. So the earliest named Thanksgiving in the English colonies does happen in the Jamestown settlement where they're specifically mandated to have a day of Thanksgiving. If you look further back in time, there's a couple of named Thanksgivings with the Spanish settlers, and one of those does include the indigenous peoples down in Florida. So what is almost a little bit more connected to our modern Thanksgiving, especially here in New England when we talk about the diet, is Forefathers Day, which I touched on. Forefathers Day happens at that, that same time of year, and it has a very traditional set of foods that go with it that are a little bit more akin to what we eat for for thanksgiving there definitely was the, the main the main meat on the dish at that harvest festival was was deer uh, there was also other fowl and such turkey probably cranberries now because you don't have sugar for the cranberries yet so the history kind of gets changed how you're talking about playing that game of telephone so mm -hmm. thanksgiving you're saying could have just been one big accidental party crash. And they're yeah. like, hey, let's do this every year. Yeah, and, and that Thanksgiving, so it was in Plymouth, you start in the, the 18th century seeing Forefathers Day celebrated starting in the 1760s. Thanksgiving as we know it is really a creation of Abraham Lincoln. So individual presidents starting with George Washington would call for a national day of Thanksgiving, but there was no, it's going to be on such and such day. It was just something that they individually did every year. You start to see a little bit more of it after Lincoln, and there's a woman whose name escapes me who really was lobbying for it. What's interesting is Roosevelt, the second Roosevelt, the, um, Franklin Roosevelt actually tried moving the day of Thanksgiving nationally to, to a, a different day because we have that weirdness with which Thursday it's on. And for people who say football and Thanksgiving don't go together, they need to look at their their history because it really does. The reason people were annoyed at Roosevelt trying to move Thanksgiving is because the football games had already been scheduled. So some states followed the federal government. Some states stayed said no, we're staying with our day of Thanksgiving, and some states did both. So we have yeah uh, we have a question from Angela. Uh, Angela, I'm going to allow you to unmute. You had a pretty interesting question about the rock itself and. Okay. Uh, the restrictions, you should be able to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. So uh, you were talking about how um, they used to, uh, the tourists used to be able to um, chip pieces off as souvenirs. And so I was just wondering when that was stopped. That's a good question. I haven't been able to find the specific answer. My guess is in the early 19th century, the 1820s, when they start moving it around more, and um, protecting it. So in 1820, 
they put this piece of Plymouth Rock that you can see right here. It was on the front hall of one of the local museums and surrounded by a fence. So my guess is, is that by that time period, it was done, but it doesn't, I haven't been able to find a primary source saying it specifically. I was doing an interview with the director of that museum for uh, NPR, All Things Considered. And we were talking about that and, and she made me very jealous because at that point she went and said, oh and yes, and my earrings are made out of chips of Plymouth Rock. Yeah. Uh, that's bad. <laughs> I want something. <laughs> but that, I mean, what it represents, and we'll let you go in a second, but if you could touch on the, the representation of the people from the Mayflower coming across, escaping uh, religious persecutions and trying to get that religious freedom in the new world. Um, how big was the, was Plymouth Rock originally? You said it's, it's double, it was double that size, right? Yeah, and, and I, I want to touch a little bit more on the motivations as well, because yeah. uh, there's, like anything, it's not as simple as history makes it out. Correct me. Please correct me if that's So true. there's about half of it, the rock is below the surface. We actually had excav excavated around it to do some additional supports. There's a crack that you can maybe see right here. That split, um, there's a great story about that split happening, but I don't think it's true. It's when they were having a parade, they dropped it. Uh, but I think that, that there's a great newspaper article about that parade that would have mentioned them dropping the rock. Um, so it's, let's see, we did the measurement. Basically, if I'm, if I go, I can't quite hug the rock. Uh, let me, I can switch pictures to another picture of me sitting next to the rock, which will give a little bit better for scale. Um, in the meantime, while I'm looking for that, the motivations there's two groups of people on the mayflower so there, there i am at the, at the rock so it's not terribly big there's two groups of people on the mayflower there's what we call the saints and the strangers the saints are the traditional pilgrims that's bradford in, in his group of separatists they had left england for the netherlands about 10 years before um i'm a little rough on my dates because it's been a while but they had left England for, for, for the Netherlands. They were living in Leiden. And they were, I don't wanna say they were actively being as persecuted as other groups were. They, things certainly were not comfortable for them in England, which is why they went to the, the Netherlands. When they chose to go to the United States or what's now the United States, it wasn't because they were actively being persecuted or being able to practice their religion. They had both of those, those things. They were losing their English identity and they wanted to keep their English identity. So the motivation for coming to the new world was one, they did want a place where they could practice their religion freely, but they also wanted to keep that English identity. Their kids were, were losing that, uh, especially after 10 years in, in the Netherlands. And I think it actually was more than that, but, um, so don't quote me on that number. The other half of the people on the Mayflower are what they call the strangers. And those people had no previous association with the, the Bradford's group. They were just there to round out the number of people going to the New World because even on their con in Bradford's congregation, they didn't have enough people who wanted to go on the first boat to sustain the colony. Now, when you get to Boston 10 years later in 1630 and the Puritans, they are actively escaping persecution. Archbishop Laud really does not like the Puritans. He, th he's, he also sees them as a threat to the government. The pilgrims, separatists, there's never enough of them where the government is really concerned about them to, to overthrow them, whereas the Puritans are a much bigger deal. Uh, in the book, and I'll, and I'll send you the title, Making Haste from Babylon goes into this really well. Uh, it's by an English author, and he, so he has a different perspective, but he goes into a lot more of the whys than um, some of the other authors. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. And um, we're gonna end in a little bit, but before we let you go, uh, can you talk to the kids about the importance of studying history and give any advice to any students who wanna follow in your footsteps career-wise as they kind of go off into the world and, and figure right. out what path they want to do. So I would say it's important to study history for a couple reasons. Um, in addition to the fact that at least for some of us, it's fun. The, the big thing is 
learning from other people's mistakes. I'd rather learn from somebody else's mistake and not make that mistake by myself um, so that I'm in, in better shape overall. So reading, reading through history, you can see how things happen both on an individual level uh, and on a societal level. And it, it does get frustrating as a historian when you're looking at your government and you're saying, no, 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 we tried that. It didn't work. Please stop. <laughs> Uh, but for somebody who is especially involved in government, it's really important to know history so we can see what's worked and what hasn't worked in the past. As far as becoming a park ranger, it's really going to depend on where you live. I can speak to my experiences here in Massachusetts and in the United States. I know that some countries have really strong national park systems and, and or local park systems. For studying, I mean, the, the most important thing when I'm hiring somebody is passion. You have to care about it and it has to show. And you have to not mind talking to people about it. You can be an introvert, that's fine. I actually am myself. But you have to not mind talking to the, the public about that, that resource. The other general quality is always willing to learn because things are always changing. Well, new research is always coming up. As far as a degree, this varies probably the most by system. Some people hiring, they want those science degrees or those history degrees. I like communications. I want them because a lot of sites are so specific that you're going to have to be learning a resource when you get there. In general, I would say a good mix of things is probably the best bet as far as what you're studying. So a little, know a, know a little bit about a lot of things rather than a very narrow view where you're really deep because when you're talking to the public you don't need you're not giving a, a doctoral thesis you're not having to go into huge detail with most people so the broader your zone of, of knowledge the the better sure uh can we have we have one more student question this from yeah, sure. and she asked this okay i want to i want to be fair to everybody so julia you should be able to unmute yes yeah, you had a pretty cool question about uh matt's job We can hear you now. Okay, perfecto. Allora, I wanted to know the, the perks of the job and the downsides. I mean... What was the question? Um, what are the perks and what are the uh, ups and the downsides to the job? What are, yeah, that's a great question. So not so much right now because I'm in a regional position, um, but especially when I was in the field in the parks, I got paid to hike and talk to people. And if you like to hike and you like to talk to people, that is a pretty good perk. The downsides, especially as I, I go higher in the administrative ranks, working for government, and I think I can safely say that it doesn't matter what your government is, working for government has a certain level of bureaucracy and policies and procedures that get in the way sometimes. And figuring out how you can do things with, like for us, one of the things is spending money. If I need to buy skulls or pelts, I can do that really easily because those are our nature things that are on our contract. If I want to buy a historical replica of something like a, a replica hat to show off, it's a little bit more of a challenge. Um, so those those administrative things are, make things a little bit harder. But uh, overall, it's it's worth it to be able to sh to share things with people and kind of see the light bulb go off over their heads. Sure. Well, thank you for keeping it real with us, Matt. And uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate you tra uh, transporting all this knowledge to us. And we hope that some of the students here, you guys pursue careers in history like Matt's. And before I end the meeting for all, um, I'm going to ask everyone to unmute. And can we all say thank you to Matt for taking time out of his busy day to come talk to you guys about his career in about Plymouth Rock. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. 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 Thank you.